going to get into my message this morning. Thank you so much. Again, I appreciate it. If you'll bear with me, I, I might cough a little bit this morning. I have a little bit of a cold going on. But that, if you can hear me, we're doing good. Amen? Oh, just kidding. All right, let's go. All right, I, I want to take my, my text this morning. will come out of the book of Matthew, the gospel uh, of Matthew. Matthew wrote this, uh, this gospel, and, and, and I like the translation here out of the New King James Version. Uh, if you will, the harvest... It's the title of my message for the next few weeks. I'm going to be preaching about the harvest, so pay special attention. I love this picture. I, I used this a few years ago about the harvest, uh, and I, I wish that I had one of these big hooks or one of those sickles, if you will. And I used to, I, I, we had one on the farm uh, a long time ago. My grandfather had one. I can't find one with the big long handle that they use, but... Um, I was looking for that, and I thought that would really be neat. But anyways, we want to look at this. Let me, if you have your Bibles, go with me to Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're going to start in verse 35, and we're going to read down through verse 38. If you don't have your Bibles with you today, I'm sure it's because you have it memorized. But if you don't have it memorized, we'll pull it up on the screen so you can follow along with us. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 35 says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers, they are few. He goes, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This morning, I want to kind of concentrate on that first part of that section of scripture. And, 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 and I want to look at verse uh, 35 and, and 36 beginning this morning. And I, I'm, we're going we're to kind of look at that this morning as, as my, the part of the sermon that I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about this morning as we start off. The first part of this is the purpose of the church. One of the things that Jesus did is exactly what the church should be doing today. Amen. That is the purpose of the church. We are here to carry on the ministry of what Jesus did when he was on the earth. When Jesus walked the earth, he healed the sick. He, he preached the kingdom of, of, of God. He, he proclaimed the good news. The purpose of the church is to be effective for what Christ did when he was here on this earth. Jesus went about the cities doing, doing what we should be doing. The church... Uh, we should be doing the same things. We should be teaching, preaching, and healing the sick and the diseased. We, we, there will never be a shortage of opportunities for us to do these things as long as we live in this sinful earth. There will always be an opportunity for us to pray, to prepare, and to minister. There will always be this opportunity and when we look at that, Jesus even said in his own ministry, as he began his ministry, after his experience of being tempted and, and then stepping up to the, 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 with the, the church, and he began to proclaim the very purpose. He took the book of Isaiah and, and, and quoted a scripture to begin to talk about the spirit of the Lord being upon him and why he had... Listen, Christ, if you want to know why we haven't gone to heaven yet, I'll tell you exactly why. Because the Spirit of the Lord came down on the day of Pentecost and anointed the church to do the very thing that Christ did. If you'll look at this scripture right here, it says exactly what Jesus quoted that he was proclaimed to do. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and to recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who um, are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. When Jesus quoted that scripture, he sat down and began to, to identify what he was there to do and what he was supposed to do, why he was there. When Jesus went up, the works that I do, the Bible says, he said, you shall do also. He set forth his motion and he set forth the purpose of the church. You see, we don't have to wonder what we're called to do. Jesus told us that that is the church and the purpose of it is so that we can be a minister. He said, greater works than these shall you do. Now, there's not much greater than raising someone from the dead. It, there's not much greater than, than healing a blinded eye or, or opening a deaf ear. It doesn't get greater than that. 
He wasn't talking about the quality of the miracle, but the quantity of the miracle. Because every believer is gifted with the opportunities and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to move in the life of the believer so that we can fulfill His purpose. We are called upon to lay hands on the sick and they should recover. We are called to preach the gospel. Turn to somebody and say, you're called to preach. I'm going to put a cough drop in so I, if I swallow it while I'm preaching, you'll know why I fell. <laughs> Anyways. We are called to preach the gospel. Now, somebody said, well, I don't preach. I'm a quiet, reserved Mm-hmm. You may be quiet and reserved, but do you know that probably the loudest thing that you preach every day around the people that you're around every day is your lifestyle? You know you preach a message the way you live? Come on. And sometimes we don't even realize that others are hearing our message loud and clear. Amen? We don't, we don't realize and recognize how that people are receiving us and the way we act. So when we look at that, I, I was telling, I told you the story of, of how that there was a lady that one time she, she was driving down the, the freeway and, and she kept, couldn't figure out why people kept honking at her, kept honking at her. She, she, she didn't understand why people kept honking at her. And finally, she, this guy got behind her and started honking and just laying on his horn. And, and the, the woman got out of the car, looked at him right in the eye and she said, what are you honking at me for? She said, because on your bumper sticker, it says honk if you love Jesus. Sometimes we can wear the T-shirt, we can carry a big Bible, but if we're not living it, we're preaching the wrong message. What do people see in your message and the lifestyle you live? You see, it's not just those. That, I love what Naomi said with Josiah when, when she, she had to deal with that situation. That was, that was, that was pretty cool. But you know, I also know a scripture that says, whom God loves, he chastens. I've been chastened many times for doing just such a thing as Josiah did. There's nothing wrong with whipping your child. Amen? Spare the rod, the Bible says, spoil the child. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Now, if you're angry, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. So if you're going to lose your temper, back away. But I'll tell you this. If God chastens you, he'll also wrap his arms around you and love you. Amen. I remember when dad used to have to whip me. And I know that's hard for you to believe that such a gentle, mild man would ever whip a child. But he was always set me, Joe, and he would set me down beside him on the bed. And he would say, son, this is going to hurt me more than it is you. I'm thinking, boy, this is going to kill you then because I know. But, you know. When he would whip me, he would always tell me, he says, I love you. I'm not doing this because I don't love you. I'm doing this because I love you. And sometimes you got to realize that, that when God's telling you he loves you, he's also telling you because you need to understand God wants to correct you. You're headed down the wrong path, son, daughter. You're heading down an area that you don't need to be in and he'll correct you. Amen. And so sometimes we've got to realize that loving God that we talk about, that, that God that loves us so much that would leave the 99. Do you know that the shepherd, when he goes to find a sheep that continues to wander away, he will break the leg of the sheep so that it doesn't wander as much? He will carry it on his shoulder, but he will discipline the sheep. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Sometimes we forget about that part of the 90 and 9. Do you know the rod was used to um, poke the sheep when they were dragging behind? You ever felt God poking you <laughs> when you're getting out of line? Or he would take the hook of the staff. And if you wonder what that hook was for, if the sheep got too far away, he would hook them around the neck and pull them back in. Sometimes God has to do that kind of stuff because he loves us so much. To guide us and direct us, to keep us in the path that we should go in. Now, somebody said, well, what does that have to do with the harvest? I'm going to tell you something. If we're not a church that understands God's love, we will never be able to love a world that's dying and going to hell. Because the same God that loves you loves them. 
And he sent his son to die for them just like he did for you. Because we're all sinners saved by grace. When I think about the idea of the harvest, then I believe that Jesus had to realize when he sat down, he realized and spoke those words to say, this is why I'm anointed. The book of Acts, if you will, is about the church doing just that, teaching, preaching and healing the sick and diseased. The church was set forth when Jesus ascended. He sent the disciples out and they begin to proclaim the gospel everywhere and anywhere they went. I'm not going to try to preach the whole book of Acts, but story after story after story in the book of Acts is about the miracle working power of God in the church, in lives of believers. God can use the introvert. God can use you. If you'll minister the gospel, just live it before them. They will see the message. And they will inquire what you've got and what they need. They will look for the work of God in your life. You see, sometimes we think that we've got to have a, a, a degree. And I, I believe in education. P please don't let me, let me talk this down. If you, if you want to and God puts a call in your heart to pursue it, you need to pursue it with all your heart. You need to study the word of God to show yourself approved. Amen? I never will forget. Joe, you'll like this story. I never will forget one time I had a a young man that was going to go into the ministry and he was saved and got saved in the church when we were at Payson and he was an energetic young man to say the least and all he wanted to do was talk about he's going to go into ministry and I said you need to read the Bible you need to get in the word and you need to start living the word and and getting it and so a few months went by and I asked him I said how you doing in reading your Bible he said I'm getting it it's 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 I I, I literally I'm getting it all the time. 24 hours a day, I'm getting this Bible. I said, 24 hours a day? What, what do you mean? You're sleeping with it? He goes, yeah, every night. I don't have time during the day to, to read it. So what I do is I just tuck it under my pillow and it just kind of oozes into me. Come on. You need to open this book and consume it. You need to read it. You need to digest it so that you can understand what God does. Amen? And who God is. You need to get this and read it. So that you know it. The Bible says know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen? Amen. When we look at the word of God, we begin to understand a little bit more about the, 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 the work of Christ and what the work of Christ has proclaimed to us. The Bible says in James, the fifth chapter, verses 14 and 15, he says, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, uh, of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has, has committed sins, his, he will be forgiven. The nature of the church is to do the work of Christ. Look at what the scripture says in verse 35. It says, and, and Jesus went about all the city and the villages and was teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. They were busy. He was busy doing the work that we are called to do. The Bible tells us in the conclusion of the book of Mark, the 16th chapter, verses 17 and 18, he says, And these signs will follow those who believe. Now, I want you to think about this. <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out a way to say this so it doesn't sound bad, but what does your bumper proclaim is what I was thinking to say, but <laughs> these signs will follow those who believe. In my name you will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. People should be able to see the signs of the evidence of Christ in you, living it and proclaiming it so that they hear the message of Jesus Christ continuously. They should see you. When you're at work. You know, I believe that a lot of times we put on Christ when we walk <clears throat> into the church on Sunday. But we leave him here until the next week. Because we live a totally different life. 
when we're at work, when we're at home. I, I used to have a friend of mine that, that I knew for years that when he would go to church, he would be the very spiritual man. He was an elder in the church and a deacon. He was very, very staunch and he would dress, look, oh, he was very open. But when he would get home, he would beat his wife. It's very abusive to his wife, very negative. I didn't know that until one day I went home with his kids and found out exactly the kind of person that he was. I'm going to tell you something. The way you live on, uh, will preach more on Monday and Tuesday than it will ever the way you show up in the house of God on, on Sunday. There's a lot of children that don't go to church because they see an example of an ungodly family. Homes are broken. Husbands and wives. We, we, listen, husbands, you, you need to, to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, you need to submit to your husbands. You need to live that example. They need to see a godly home. They need to see the best that they can see of the representation of who Christ is in all of us. And when you blow it, Naomi, that's right. You blow it. We all have done it. I, I, one time, now, I'm, I'm, I'm going for Father of the Year, so please keep this to yourselves, but one time, there was an accident at the house, and I was so upset, I came in, and the kids were all there, and I said, who did this? And Brittany said, Brandon did it. So I took Brandon, and I whipped Brandon and Brittany was crying when I came out of the room. And I said, what is wrong with you? And she said, I did it. I just didn't want to get a whooping. <laughs> so then I whipped Brittany. And then I hugged them both. I think I, I, I think I hugged them both for about the same amount of time. Brandon, I'm sure, needed a whipping for something else he had already done. But I was just <laughs> catching up. But... Sometimes we got to understand that that's the, the, the godliness of, of what we do is representing Christ. And when you make a mistake around somebody, there's nothing wrong with to say, sorry, I blew it. You know? It's, it's hard to say, but we do make mistakes. And we're not perfect but if we will represent Christ, asking, the Bible says that, that if, we, if, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And that, that if we sin, we, we can confess that sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our unrighteousness. One time I was driving with Joey and, and he, there was a guy that kept cutting me off. And I said, you stupid idiot. And I got around that guy and I drove in the car. And, you know, I got, and I was, Joey was in the car seat in the back and he was, at that time, he was 14, but oh, he was three, two or three. I don't remember. He wasn't very old. I think two, but I was driving, and, and when, when we got up beside the, the next light, this guy pulled up beside me, and out of the back seat, I hear, idiot! <laughs> Joe, don't say that. Your mother's going to scold both of us. <laughs> See, sometimes we speak with our life, even when we think no one is listening. We are living and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is, the, what is our church saying to this community? What are we saying to the people around us? What do you say to your family? What are you saying uh, to, to the people at work in your community? What, do you, what are we saying to the people around our neighborhood? What are we saying? Leave me alone. I want to be isolated. I don't want anybody bothering me. We lock it up in all the security and hold on to it and say, we've got it. Let's gain it. Or can we say, God, let us be useful for the kingdom of God in whatever way that we can touch it, the community, help us to do so. Amen. One of the things that, that we started was, is a new ministry. James, come up here for a minute. Let me drag you up here. We're, we're, we've had this ministry on and off for a while and it's been a hit and miss but I got James working right now. He's helping me and we are starting and, and we're pushing it forward with our outreach ministries. Mm -hmm. We're starting to do something. Now, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be setting up down here on this corner down here in front of our church by our church sign. We got a little canopy. We got little water bottles. 
And on those water bottles, it says Life Church at South Mountain. And believe it or not, we're going to give those away and not charge a dime for them. Now, we paid money to have those bottles made. And it cost us money. But you know what? We're going to do that because we want the community to know we're not here. We do the fall festival without charging anything for it. Why? Listen, we're going to do food baskets. We're going, to, we get, we're going to be doing the ministry of it. It's not so that we can gain more. It's so that we can reach more. Because I can tell you this, the world is hurting and they need to know that the church is not about their money, but about their heart. And that's what I said. I wanted to find somebody with a big heart and I found him. I want him to help me as much as he can. And if you can help him, when we start these projects, I want you to say, hey, what can I sign up for and what can I do? Amen? Because he's going he's gonna to need some help to carry that load. This is a, it's going to be a big project. There's a lot of things that are going to come underneath this outreach ministry. He's going to need some help. And when he does, don't run away from him. I know, I know he's, he, we want to avoid him, but you need to, to come when he, when he talks to you. Because he's going to say, can you help me? And we need to do that. You may help him fill water bottles. You may help him go out here. And you may, may help him pass out the water bottles. Maybe, maybe you can help by signing up back here in the fall festival or whatever you do. But see, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're showing the community that we're not about it. I, I've had so many people come to our church. Thank you, James. Unless you just wanted to stand up here and hug on me no, for a minute. No. <laughs> Get out of here. Here's what, here's what we, we, I believe the church should be, is we must be about, you know what, more people than not will say that they don't want to come to church because number one, they don't want to be with a bunch of hypocrites. Turn to the person beside you right now, look them right in the eyes and say, are you a hypocrite? <laughs> Some of you might have answered yes, I don't know, but. Here, here's the problem. Here's the problem. The church claims and preaches and teaches one thing and we live and act totally different because of our arrogance. I get angry when I see people that, that want, they want to, everybody to come to church, but they want to live and they want to be hard and they want to be, and I, I don't want anything to do with that. If you look like you suck the bucket of lemons, I ain't going to hang around you. The church should be joyful and, and we should love and we should, we should have the ability to be loved. Amen. Amen. I believe that the church where, where we've got to come to the place of realizing the need for the harvest, Jesus didn't size up the community and say there's some that are really in bad shape and there are others that aren't. Let's only do for those. If anything... You can look at this up and you can find out. But if anything, Jesus was harder on those who were of the religious sect than he was for the sinner. You know why? Because the sinner needed a savior and the religious thought they were already righteous. I'm, you know what I pray every day? God, keep me humble. Keep me humble to let, you, let me know and let me live like I represent Christ and I know that I couldn't be saved without him. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything without him. I need him. You know, I, somebody was telling me the other day, they, they, they said that, you know, all, all the things that they do and everything, they were bragging on, on, on all the projects that they had accomplished and everything like that. And, you know, the, it just, just the Holy Spirit struck me and they said, you know, he hasn't mentioned my help once. I think that sometimes we think it's really us when it, we couldn't do anything without him. I believe the second part of this message that, that I want to preach this morning is about the effect that we have on the world around us. You see, the church has got to make an impact in the community that we live in. We have got to make an impact and we've got to reach into this community and tr change the community. The, the church in this world, we should be the light in a dark place should be a bright and shining pedestal and we should make an impact it should be a church that proclaims the love of Christ in every way and every standard amen we should be able to, to to reach out and say it doesn't matter where you come from or what you are or what you do amen what matters is that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ 
the harvest and all the things that are going on in the world today. Listen, Jesus told us a few weeks ago, I preached a message about all the things that are happening in the world today. And there's a great reason why Jesus said these things have to take place and then the end will come. There's a reason why all the earthquakes and the storms and and everything like that are happening. I believe we're getting ready. I believe that if you can, all of heaven is getting ready. It's like, have you ever seen a stage when an orchestra is getting ready to play? They have the microphones around on the the chairs on the floor and they're tuning their instruments and they're picking it up and they're getting ready to to play. And, And all of that is going on in heaven right now. I believe the orchestras are, are, are getting ready and everything is getting ready to play and it won't be very long before the first part of the downstroke of that song will be a trumpet will sound. And the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first and that we which remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And I believe there's a time when the, that downstroke is going to come. The sound is going to happen and the harvest will begin. Amen. The catching away of the saints will go. Amen. That's why the urgency of this season is so important for us. I don't know how much longer we have on this earth. I don't know how much longer this this season will go on. Jesus told us that we don't know the day nor the hour, but we could tell by the signs. And I can tell you this, the signs are getting more prevalent and more evident than ever before. That something big is about to happen in this world that we live in. They can call it global warming, but I they haven't seen global warming yet, honey. It's going to burn. And then we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. There are some things that we need to understand that's going on in this world. And it's not because God is angry. It is because the understanding that God is preparing the church. And the reason that the church is still here is because there's a lost world that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they need to hear it and they need to see it in the church again. We can come in and sit on comfortable pews. We can do all the stuff that we do. But if we're not reaching them with the love of Christ, we're missing the opportunity we have today. If you want to know what really gets me the most is to have a church full of people and no one in the altar. I hope you're, you're, listen, somebody said, Pastor, you are angry today. (laughs) No, I am passionate today. Because I look at the people that drive up and down this road that don't even know this church is here. Uh, That that looks like a freeway sometimes in the afternoon if you've ever been on it. I'm going to tell you something, it's bumper to bumper from one end to the other end. If you drive in it, don't get angry about it. Thank God that we have a place here. And and what we need to do is say, God, those are souls. And you put us here for this season. And you've got us here for right now. Help us to do something to reach them. Amen? Somebody said, well, I don't think that's very spiritual to put those bounce houses out there on the front of the church property. I, I don't think it's very spiritual to, to do that. I, I'm going to tell you something. But some of the most spiritual things you can do, you may not think, I don't know. Uh, I, did, would Jesus have put a bounce house in front of the temple? I don't know. He, 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 I can tell you this, that I believe Jesus would have done what he needed to do to reach a lost and dying world. Uh, listen, you may not even be in you may, you may not even like bounce houses. I don't. I get in there and, and those kids maul me to death. They think I'm part of the jumping machine. You, you may not like it at all, but just your presence, being a part of it. Listen, if you're angry and you're gonna <laughs> I'm going to use you, okay? Can I do that? (laughs) He goes, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Every year, Manny gets drafted because he's such a good artist. 
to do face painting. And all the kids want Manny to paint him. And, and last year, from the time he got here to the time that we closed down, they were still lined up for him to paint on his face. And you know what? I, my, if, if it was me, I would have hurried the process so I could have got through the line. I would have just used a roller. <laughs> you're done, you're done, you're done. Not this guy. And he does it, and he does it with so detailed, and he does it with so much love. And the kids walk around, and they, look what I got, look what I got. Here, I'm going to tell you this. You may not realize the impact that you make just by the little things that you do. Somebody came to me the other day, and they said, you know what? They gave me a second bag of candy. And then I found out that he actually took some of the kids' candy, but... I will tell you something. If they can go away from this campus and they can say, they really loved me. They really cared about me. They, they wanted that for me. If, they could, if, we can, if we can represent Christ enough that people, when they drive by this church, they can say, oh yeah, that's the church that does that fall festival. Right now, right now if anybody says anything about our church, they don't know where it is. I always say, well, you know, it's at 40th and Baseline. The first thing out of their mouth every time is, there's no church at 40th and Baseline. I drive down that all the time. I said, yes, there is. We're the church with the big blue cross. Oh, yeah. I see that cross up the road up there. I said, we're at 40th and Baseline. I'll have to stop by and check it out. I said, you do that. The preacher is really good. You need to come hear him. Usually I tell them, I said, we're a loving church. We love everybody. We, we, we're, not, we're, not, we're not driven by age. We're not driven by race. We're not, we're not, our, our, our love encompasses everyone from every nature of every background. Sinner and saint, we come together to sit under the love of Christ. And the purpose of the work of the church has got to be that we impact it. You see, I believe with all my heart that we must affect the world around us. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Robert. I was preaching and got away from my notes. It says, but when, we, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Does it affect you when you see someone that's lost? Or do you... Mm. When, when, when you see someone that's scattered and having no shepherd. Yet the Bible says there that when he saw he was moved with compassion, it affected Jesus. When he saw the hurting and the broken, it affected him. Enough so that he said the harvest is truly ready. All the things that are happening, it should, it should motivate us and move us to see the need to make a difference in our community. When I look at this, I begin to, to see the idea of what the, the scattered sheep were like. And I looked at it because it was as if they had no shepherd, nothing to guide them, no one to lead them, no place to go. They were lost and wandering. They couldn't find where they were to be. The illustration comes to me that, that they were sheep that had wandered away from the pack and they had fallen into the praise of the weariness of the, uh, of the, of the society that was swallowing them up. They needed a Savior. What better way for us than to be the bridge that guides them and directs them to a Savior? It's true. The, the gospel is true. The message is true. We can save no one, but we can lead them to the cross. It is not our task to save them, but to share the message and the love of Christ with everyone we meet. The harvest is ready. It is ready. Jesus told his disciples in John, the fourth chapter, verse 35 says, Do not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. I don't believe I've ever preached a harvest message that I haven't referred to this scripture at, at some time during the series. Most of you that have, have heard me preach, you've heard me say this scripture before. Because... I like what it says right here. It says, 
do not say this, that, 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 that there are four months until the harvest. You, you can sit here and say, well, we got another weekend. Thank God for it. But what have you done for the kingdom of God and those and that that God's blessed you with? Have you made a difference? Have you done anything with it? I was telling a lady at the, the motel, and I, I was there, and just had, they were, she was cleaning up, and I was waiting on my mother-in-law, and I was going to put her luggage in the car, and she come out, and she had been working all morning, waiting on all the tables. These women are slobs when they're away from you guys. I'm telling you, I'm just that she had to work so hard to clean the, the tables and everything. She was, and she was finished, and you could see it in her face. She was tired. And I said, thank you so much. God bless you. I said, you have such a big heart to wait on all these people. She goes, oh, I wouldn't do it if they didn't pay me. <laughs> and I said, yeah, they pay you to clean up the tables, but they don't pay you to smile. They don't pay you to be kind. And I said, that's what I say thank you for. And I said, God bless you. She goes, well, thank you. And she, did, she didn't wait maybe two seconds. And she turned around and she said, are you a preacher? I said, yeah, but I'm just a person that loves Jesus and Jesus loves you. And she turned around and she goes, thank you more for that than anything. She walked away. I, I'm going to tell you something. Maybe I, maybe I didn't, maybe I will never, ever see her kneel at an altar to pray. But she heard a message that day. That Jesus loves you. That's all sometimes we have to do is share the love of Jesus with those we come to meet. Amen. I want Roberto, if he will, to come. He's going to play as we close. The harvest is ready. It's ripe. We're prepared. We've got to get our eyes off of our own circumstances, lift up our eyes and look and see the fields that they are ready for harvest. They are white, the Bible says, prepared and ready. It's almost to the point where the fields and the crops were ready. Many times as I was growing up in the fields of Indiana, I saw the whiteness of the wheat as it began to prepare. The farmers were waiting eagerly so that they could draw in the harvest of the year and they could draw it in. And the, as it became more white and the waves would begin to blow and the wind would blow across it. I can tell you that right now across this country there is white that is blowing in the wind and it's because God is preparing a nation because he's about to return and he's calling us and he's calling the church to reach the harvest. I would see those fields and the farmers they would eagerly wait for their opportunity to go into the field and bring in the harvest. I can tell you this. I left you with the illustration of the orchestra in heaven. But I like this scripture right here. I want to end this portion of our scripture today. Out of Revelation 14th chapter and verse 15. It's the powerful message. Because it's not going to be very long before this will happen. The Bible tells us in Revelation, the 14th chapter, and verse 15, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the throne, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's time. It's time. It's time. Everything around us is happening. Nothing that is happening is surprising God. Come on. The evidence of these things that are going on in this world today are for the church to wake up and realize we have got to get busy. Reach the lost. Reach the lost. Share the message and the love of Christ. I love it when... I get a call from somebody. I remember a while ago, Jennifer called me about a friend of hers that went through a tragedy. She said, Pastor, I was, she lost a, a, a baby and there was a situation where I had to step in as a pastor to help a little bit. More than anything, she was sharing that the love of Christ to, to, a, to a hurting person. 
they needed to hear that. And I, the best thing I can tell you is, is what she does, is she doesn't, doesn't leave it. She didn't hang her Jesus up on, on her way out on Sunday, like we do our choir robes when we used to have them. Get off the choir, we'd hang it up. Because if we didn't, our choir would, robe or director, our choir director would beat us to death with the hanger. That was my mom. But anyways, we don't hang our Jesus up on the way out. Him up on Sunday when we come back. You see, I love it when you're at work and you, Pastor, I got a situation. I've been witnessing somebody and you're going to have to tell me how to tell him to love Jesus. You're going to have to, man, I, that's the best phone calls I get. Pastor, there's a person that's sick going through, they're, they're sick. Pastor, I need, I, will you join with me and let's pray together? Pastor, can I bring, it would be great if you had somebody at your work that they needed prayer, that you'd show up on Tuesday night and we'd gather together and we'd pray for them. Laura used to drag her neighbors in all the time. She, she, even, she even gets a hold of people from Mexico and they drive all the way from Mexico just so they can be in church to pray with us. Didn't they? I, I'm, I'm not telling you anything. If you get the word out that God is healing and doing miracles, people will come. Because there's a world that needs a God who does that. There's a world that needs a church that's doing that. Amen? I want us to stand right now all across this place. With your hearts and minds open, I'm going to pray. I'm going to close. I'm not, I'm, I know that this message is about the harvest, but one of the heart part of this harvest service is this. Every heart and mind needs to be fixed on Christ. And the first thing I want to say in every service is this. If your heart is not right with Christ right now, your message is beating unclearly. Not only to you, but it is to the world around you. Be to your family, to those that closest to you. So you need to make sure today, you need to make a decision today to choose Jesus Christ. If what I'm saying today and what I'm preaching about the harvest being ready and it's coming very soon, then you don't have times to play games with God. You don't have times to be in and out. You don't have time to, to, to take your, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get right with God when the time is right. You don't have that. This could be our last meeting together. This could be our last meeting together.